All right, well, thanks, Sharon, for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm going to focus on a hernia-specific surgical site infection bundle uh, to reduce surgical site infections after these procedures. Uh, the majority of the data I'm going to show you, we've tried to focus specifically on hernia surgery, but for, for many uh, areas, there, there is no data in the realm of hernia. And so when that occurs, I will substitute in data that we know from other uh, similar surgical procedures. These are my disclosures, which will have really nothing to do with what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I'd like to review pre-op intra-op and post-operative management strategy for ventral hernia patients that have been shown to reduce surgical site infections. And uh, I'd like to review some of the other maneuvers, things that we do and that we've all seen that, that may or may not have data uh, behind them. And uh, since this is a, meant to be a multidisciplinary team sort of approach, I will focus on areas where maybe not necessarily the surgeon, but the rest of the team members can make a difference. So surgical site infections are one of the more common problems after hernia repair, um, depending on what type of technique you use and what class the wound is. Obviously, those rates will, will range greatly, but 19% is roughly what's given for most open repairs. Uh, it is the most common problem for someone to get readmitted back after an open hernia repair. And it's a significant predictor of hernia recurrence and, interestingly, of re-recurrence. If you've had a hernia and had an infection, and are getting another operation, that surgical site infection predicts your chance of getting a hernia back at your second hernia operation. So this is important. It's important for a lot of other reasons, one of, the, one of which is we are, as surgeons, under increasingly large amount of scrutiny to avoid avoidable complications. I'm not saying that all infections are avoidable, but to the extent that we can do some of these things and optimize patients a bit better, as Dr. Nowitzki is going to talk about later on, we can make these numbers better. Uh, complications will ultimately be linked to our payment, and therefore we need to be aware of these things. These problems are complex and they're multifactorial, and uh, these um, tools that I'm going to show you all work uh, concomitantly uh, to reduce the rate of surgical site infection. So we'll break this down, as I said, to pre-op, intra-op, and post-op uh, maneuvers. So pre-op. Uh, you're going to get uh, from Yuri in a, in a few minutes here an entire pathway of enhanced recovery, which includes some of the points that I'm going to touch on, but we're going to focus a little bit on different parts. So for starters, when I meet folks and we're talking about options for repair, we look at the patient's risk of a, a surgical site infection and we talk about, are you a better candidate for a laparoscopic repair than an open repair because of risk factors? And if they are a candidate for a laparoscopic repair, we know that that reduces the risk of a surgical site infection and we will offer that to patients. Uh, recognizing that we can reduce the rate. And there are multiple studies that show this. Um, great study here showing that for both reducible hernias and for irreducible hernias, the rates of surgical site infections between open and laparoscopic cases are all significantly different in favor of laparoscopy. And I think that's a well-established fact, but let's, let's also not forget that, that wound infections happen laparoscopically. This is a patient of mine who had a robotic-assisted transversus abdominis release. We're all high-fiving, the wound looks great, we're finishing up the operation, long day. Seven days later, she comes back with a wound infection in the midline wound that we never opened. And this is MRSA infected and ultimately requires a full thickness abdominal wall debridement, and we have exposed polypropylene mesh. So wound infections happen after laparoscopic cases, and if patients have risk factors that you can modify, you best modify them if you can. So what are those modifiable risk factors? Well, diabetes, we know, is associated with surgical site infections at an odds ratio of 1.5. This is an effect that is independent of the patient's BMI. Um, many hernia surgeons use 8 as their BMI, or as their HbA1c cutoff for hernia surgery, but there are, is an increasingly larger body of data that suggests that getting it down as close to 7 as possible is associated with fewer infectious complications. Uh, the CEDAR app from Carolinas uses 7.3 as the cutoff uh, for uh, wound problems. I try to get as many of my folks down to 7 as possible, and uh, Yuri will talk about how to, how to make that happen in real life. This is from uh, the Cantor's paper on ventral hernia working group. You can see that diabetes has an odds ratio of 2.58 for post-operative wound problems. I think we all recognize that nicotine use has a bad effect on wound healing. I don't make all of my patients stop smoking, but for all of my open ab wall reconstruction patients, I do. Um, there is excellent data on the wound healing properties that, that uh, come along with nicotine use. I, I generally set a, a data point of a minimum of four weeks, and this is one of the points here where um, I rely on my uh, uh, physician extenders to make sure that we're checking these ahead of time. And I actually check nicotine on the day of surgery the same way my bariatric surgeons do, and so my pre-op nurses know that if my ab wall patients come in, 
and they have a history of smoking, the first thing that happens is they get a urine nicotine dip, and if it's positive, we cancel the case. Uh, again, several papers show that uh, smoking in the, in the realm of ab wall reconstruction surgery has a very high odds ratio of uh, complications and problems. Interestingly, uh, we looked at it in a separate paper regarding ways to reduce surgical site uh, infections. And in, in this group, the odds ratio is only 1.29, which was not statistically significant. However, this was a study that had a very small number of smokers and was really underpowered to show a difference. So uh, I, I do believe firmly, despite my own paper here, that, that smoking makes a big difference for these patients. Um, MRSA eradication and testing has, in, in many areas of surgery, including cardiac surgery, shown to uh, make a difference in wound problems. For hernia surgery in particular, uh, there's really no consistent literature. Um, testing for this is as expensive as treating for it, and so many people who have ab wall reconstruction centers simply treat everybody with nasal uh, Bactroban to uh, attempt to eradicate MRSA. Um, Interestingly, uh, preoperative chlorhexidine washes to reduce MRSA uh, have, um, in, have some conflicting data for hernia surgery, and we're getting increasingly more data coming out of the American Hernia Society Quality Collaborative and Ben Paulus' efforts that shows that these chlorhexidine washes may actually increase the risk of surgical site infections uh, in ab wall reconstruction and hernia patients. Um, one last uh, word on uh, mesh infections. There, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the use of uh, polypropylene. There is increasingly larger amounts of data that sublay polypropylene may be safe in MRSA patients, something that I think a few years ago we would not be talking about. Um, my last bit of uh, infectious management stuff that I do pre-op is if people have a wound infection, uh, have an active draining sinus, I always culture it. Universally, it's skin flora, but I want to know if there's pseudomonas there, if there is MRSA there. I want to know what the right antibiotics are going to be in the operating room. Immunosuppression is kind of a mixed bag. I think we all understand that by, by nature of the word immunosuppression, this suppresses the immune system and has an inability to uh, heal wounds correctly. This is again from the Ventral Hernia Working Group modification uh, study by Cantor and uh, Mike Rosen and Yuri Nowitzki. They did not find a, a high odds ratio or a statistically significant effect on immunosuppression, but again, the study was underpowered, and immunosuppression in this regard became a, a catch-all for a lot of different things. Regarding specifically for hernia surgery, there's not really good data about the management of immunosuppression. I can tell you what I do, which is if the immunosuppression can be reduced, I send the patient back to whoever the provider is who's prescribing it and say, can we reduce this at all? Um, if they can stop it or miss a dose because they're getting it for uh, suppression for um, rheumatoid arthritis and they don't mind missing a few doses and the rheumatologist doesn't mind, then I ask if we can do that. And, and you usually get a pretty positive response from folks who understand that you're worried about the patient's wound and uh, mesh. Interoperatively, what are the things that we do? Well, you know, before you cut, we always follow our skip guidelines. Again, this is not specific to hernia surgery, but uh, we, we choose our antibiotics based off of skip guidelines. We redose based off of skip. We use clippers and not razors. Um, Non-iotophore incised drapes actually have good data out of the UK NICE guidelines to show that they actually can increase wound infection rates by trapping warm, moist air against the skin. Um, regarding iodine impregnated gauze drapes, there's some studies that suggest that it works. Um, the question ultimately becomes, are, are they worth the expense because these drapes are expensive? I, I do use them for my open ab wall papers, uh, reconstructions, recognizing that the papers don't support my practice in doing that. There's an overwhelming majority of evidence that shows that skin prep with alcohol rather than povidone iodine uh, reduces surgical site infections, and I think that's what most centers are moving to. After I cut, I do a lot of things uh, as a surgeon to try and keep that wound as clean as possible. I do not remove organs that are perfectly fine staying where they are. I'm not going to change it to a clean contaminated case to take out somebody's uh, otherwise asymptomatic gallbladder or appendix. And I will spend hours lysing adhesions to not make enterotomies, and I think that that, that uh, bears out in my personal wound infection rates in the quality collaborative. Any infection that I find, any concern for infection, I culture because, again, I want to know how to target my postoperative antibiotics. I'll, uh, I'll leave the point about pulse irrigation uh, for a couple slides from now. Uh, I will say that uh, drains uh, will likely be shown to be uh, protective of surgical site infections. Uh, Alfie Carbonell is going to present uh, at the American Hernia Society meeting later on uh, this month. And he has shown that uh, drains are protective of uh, wound problems afterwards. So if you want to leave a drain for your hernia repair, there's data that says you should, probably should.
Uh, by surgical side approach, uh, again, as a surgeon, I get to pick my technique. We know that uh, anterior component separations and bridge repairs have higher rates of uh, surgical side infections than sublay. I do believe that the sublay space is, from, from my perspective, in my patients, the preferred place to put the mesh. Uh, we also know that uh, skin operations that involve larger skin resections, like paniculectomies, can increase the weight of wound problems, and I don't do those concomitant with my ab wall reconstruction if I can avoid them. Let's talk about mesh for a few minutes here. This is again from the Cantor's paper in Ventral Hernia Working Group, and I want to show you the bottom of the slide here, which says that mesh selection of biologic had an odds ratio of 2.67, statistically significant, to increase the rate of postoperative surgical site infections. Now, some of that is selection bias because they were putting mesh into patients who had higher class wounds, but the question is, is there something intrinsic to biologic meshes that maybe increases the risk of wound problems? And I think that we're in a stage right now of hernia repair where the pendulum is swinging from the uh, aggressive use of biologics in these higher, higher risk of contaminated patients to the use of carefully chosen synthetic meshes. Um, lightweight polypropylene mesh uh, in select patients, in select locations in the abdominal wall, has favorable factors uh, for wound infections afterwards. This is some data that I presented with uh, Yuri Nowitzki earlier this month at Central Surgical, comparing biologic meshes to synthetic meshes in uh, clean and clean contaminated cases, looking at superficial and deep wound infections, which were statistically less in the bi uh, synthetic group, looking at uh, rates of mesh uh, explant hernia recurrence, length of stay, and 90-day readmission uh, the, the latter three were all in favor of the use of synthetic mesh in those circumstances. So this may not be for everybody, but again, if you have comfortability and you're okay with putting polypropylene in the sublay space, I think there's going to be an emerging body of data that says that your mesh selection here may be helpful to reduce the, the wound complication rate. Other stuff we do in the operating room, um, changing gowns, uh, changing uh, drapes, changing uh, your gloves after dirtier parts of the operation. There's no data to support doing it. Um, it. It makes common sense, but the question is, is it worth, again, is it worth the expense? And there's no answer to that question. You know, not letting the mesh touch the skin, again, is something very anecdotal. I'm sure that we've all seen or been told not, not to do that during hernia repairs. Uh, I don't make a big deal about it uh, with my open repairs, but um, it's something that we certainly do without data. Uh, irrigation, irrigation with antibiotics, antibiotics um, there, there is data, uh, some, uh, some of this, this is published and some of it not published, that pulse lavage for cases longer than six hours can reduce the surgical site infection rate in clean and clean contaminated cases, and I, I do this on all of my open ab wall reconstructions. Uh, there is clear evidence that monofilament suture use in these repairs reduces wound problems and surgical site infections and sinuses down the road, but that the use of antibiotic impregnated suture is not justified based on the cost. Uh, for, for hernia, hernia surgery, surgery eu euthermia afterwards, afterwards is mixed data. I think if you work at a place that follows skip measures and you, you have colorectal patients who are being treated as euthermic, it's not very hard for your anesthesiologists to make sure that your hernia patients uh, are also euthermic. And so I ask my folks to do this on my patients as well and just treat them the same. It certainly, it certainly doesn't hurt and it's, it's free. It's, you know, air. Um, closure, there is the nice data in the UK does, does support uh, covering incisions with a dressing. Um, you know, there's not a clear role for negative pressure wound therapy in high-risk abdominal wall wounds. For colorectal wounds, yes. For um, uh, sternal wounds, yes. Um, I actually looked at this uh, as a fellow with um, Mike Rosen and Yuri Davitsky. We were, we were closing all of these wounds. We were putting adaptic down and a, a black uh, vac setting it to negative 75. You know, it didn't really make a difference. When we looked at uh, groups that had a VAC and, and groups that didn't, the odds ratio did not support using the VAC. It was just an added expense. Uh, I will still use it, though, for certain cases. This is a peristomal repair. We've moved the ostomy from this location here to the contralateral side. And I like the VAC for a few reasons. One is I usually VAC this old stomacite to begin with, so I can just tee it up on the midline incision. And number two, I put my ostomy appliance over top. And if the ostomy bag does wind up leaking, my midline dressing is not saturated with stool. It's essentially a very cheap way, a relatively cheap way to keep that wound clean for the first seven days after the repair. And that's exactly how long I leave it on. Postoperatively, again, I follow skip guidelines and stop the antibiotics within 24 hours. We always follow up on our cultures from the operating room to make sure that our antibiotics are targeted specifically to the infections uh, if we've identified any. There's pretty good data that says topical antibiotics on wounds are not indicated, and so we don't do that. Um, regarding drain management post-op, there's really not a lot of good data. There's certainly a lot of uh, what, what people do, but uh, the use of antibiotics for drains is not supported. 
Uh, there is no data to support the timing of drain removal, and for most of my uh, complex operations, I simply remove the drains before the patients leave the building. A lot of folks are starting to put the silver impregnated uh, dressings around their drains the same way we put them around central lines. Again, it's relatively harmless to do. It does add some expense, but there's no data to support doing it. Postoperatively, I'm pretty aggressive with the management of hyperglycemia. This is a paper that I worked on with my senior colleague, David Soybell, uh, looking at uh, postoperative hyperglycemia. For patients who had postoperative hyperglycemia, whether they were diabetic or not, if they had glucoses above 140, they were delayed in their time to meal, they were delayed in their discharge, and their operations wound up being more expensive. If they had more than one event of hyperglycemia, again, they wound up in the hospital longer, and again, the cases, uh, the, the total operation cost the hospital more. So postoperative management of hyperglycemia is important. And lastly, uh, given that this is a talk about uh, teamwork, I'm going to point out this article from last month's uh, JAX. This is looking at colorectal patients across multiple hospital systems with different case volumes. And they asked the staff involved in caring for these patients about their understanding of the culture of safety with regards to surgical site infection. For facilities that scored very high in these measures that are, that are noted here, and after adjusting for the case volume, these dimensions of a safety culture were associated with lower rates of surgical site infection. So as Sharin said earlier, how many of you feel empowered to make a difference? If you feel empowered to talk with your team members about teamwork within your unit and between the units and you know overall cultures of safety and somebody saying, listen, don't be afraid to speak up if you see break in sterility because we want to know. Uh, in colon surgery, you're likely to have a lower rate of surgical site infections and I would argue that this, this will probably hold true for other areas of complex uh, general surgery. With that, I'll stop. Thank you.